The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. How about if we just acted like humble, courageous, generous servant kings to all those people around us? We don't want a bunch of guys sitting around telling themselves, I'm going to try harder not to look at pornography. I'm going to try harder to be a better dad. We want guys to fall on their face before the Lord and say, I'm giving up my pride because only the grace of Jesus Christ can change my heart. Promise Keeper's Ken Harrison explains that true masculinity is found in absolute surrender to God. Next on Life Today. Welcome to Life Today. I'm James Robinson. Betty, you're my wife. We are thrilled. We're thrilled to be able to spend this time with you, and I mean that. And you may say, well, I just was glad you're not here in the room with us, wherever that might be or whatever time of day. And I understand that. But I wish you could understand how much being able to talk to you about the greatest source of love, compassion in the universe, our Lord and our Father. To be able to share that with you is so meaningful. And, and listen to this now. God promises to answer prayer. And I believe the man you're about to meet is not only an answer to the prayers of serious Lord God-seeking Christians, but I believe an answer to the prayer of Jesus. I really believe that. And I've been encouraging you to pray for spiritual awakening for a long time. I believe we're about to see one. This book, Rise of Servant Kings, the minute I heard about this man, Ken Harrison, I never heard of him. He didn't, he didn't know me. And I really do believe that this is a man sent from God by God for the glory of God to bless all of us. And we together welcome Ken Harrison, who has been the chairman of several boards, who has been a police officer and a pretty effective, pretty tough one. He's been an athlete. You've had quite a journey. And now then you are chairman of the board of Promise Keepers. And see, since I watched Promise Keepers born in a gymnasium with a bunch of men just seeking God, and then I watched it put way over a million people in the mall, and I was the last speaker there and became very close to Coach McCartney, I knew God had done a great work. And then all of a sudden, it's just kind of gone. My friend Coach and his wife sat here and kind of told their story of him missing the mark, but it just kind of faded away. It shouldn't have. All of a sudden, it's been resurrected. And Ken, you never dreamed you would have anything to do with that resurrection, do you agree that something very supernatural has happened, even in the fact that you are now leading Promise Keepers? It, it would take me a couple of hours just to talk about all the miraculous connections that the Lord has made, including us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's just take off on your journey because this, if I just sat here and read the chapter titles, you would pause and everyone say, I want, I want to know what that is. I want to know what that is. I want to know what that is. And I may, I may do that in a moment, but here's the thing. One of the most miraculous journeys by a man that by every standard in every year you call him successful. Why is, it, why is he doing this and he doesn't even take a salary? Why is he doing this? An answer to those of you who are real serious about your prayer life. Take us on your journey a little bit. Would you please, as a police officer, or back to how you grew up yeah. in religion? Well, my father had been a Los Angeles police officer, and he'd been shot in the Watts riots in 1965 and uh, retired us up to Oregon when I was young and got saved. And I got saved at a, five years old, filled with the spirit. And I used to go knock on doors at five with my little clip-on tie, my little patent leather white shoes, and <laughs> hand out tracks. And one day, my mother saw Ricky Nelson in the airport in the early 70s and said, Kenny, that's a famous rock star. So I chased him down through the airport, and I witnessed to him for five minutes. And that guy graciously stood there and listened to me for five minutes telling him about <laughs> Jesus. But um, unfortunately, we got involved in a really legalistic church. And I often say, you know, it took the church about 10 years to beat the Holy Spirit out of me. <laughs> and uh, I thank God. You know, it was one of those churches where it was, you've heard me tell the stories of someone yelling at me because I was reading a New American Standard Bible instead of a King James and <laughs> rock and roll and dancing and movies. And if it was fun, it was bad. And uh, <laughs> 
Luckily, uh, I got out of that church at 15 years old and went to Stu Weber's church in Portland, Oregon, and Stu really helped to you know, went to save his. my life. His wasn't yeah. the one you got out of. No. This is the one you got Stu into. is a great Stu, man of God. exactly what you're about, buddy. <laughs> so you got out of that one and ended up in Stu's. But during that course of that time, that legalism, at the age of 12, I started reading the Bible every day. I just, I don't know what it was, but at 12, I think when we're filled with the Spirit, there's just, you know Jesus. And I knew Jesus, and the, the Jesus, these people were telling me about and, and beating me over the head with. The people were telling me that Billy Graham wasn't a Christian mm. because he didn't have the right theology. I was, they didn't know Jesus. And so I really got to know the, God's word really, really well. But the wounding of the church was so deep that by the time I was 18 years old, I walked with the Lord. Uh, my wife and I went to church, we've been involved, but I was checked out of Christian culture. And so that's why I didn't know who you were when I met you. <laughs> um, and it's given me a great perspective because I have no idea who I'm supposed to be impressed by. And, and as I've gone down this journey lately and gotten to know people, I just get to know people. And I don't know who the famous pastors are or who, the, who they're not. And it's been, and I've got to say, the preconceived notions I thought I would have had when I met certain people. And you, you know, when I met Paula White, I thought, man, what a humble, humble woman. Uh, a it's broken been nice. servant. She's a servant, amazingly. Yeah. So I got on the LAPD to follow my dad's footsteps, did that. Uh, after the Rodney King stuff and all the gang wars, uh, then got into business and God gave me great success in business. And so I had basically retired in 2012 at the age of 45 and was doing what I think the devil tells us is what a good Christian man should do, which was not much. I was a good man and coaching my son's football teams, but nothing that was going to change the world. And then God got a hold of me and uh, I was praying. I've always been a man of deep prayer and scripture. But I was praying and the Lord came to me in a very vivid way and he said, I did not teach you what I did and put you through all that I did so that you could ski and hike for the rest of your life. And I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And he said, are you willing to be as ambitious for my kingdom as you were for your kingdom? Wow. And it came with a deep warning of be careful of your answer. It's going to cost you everything. And I got to tell you, I wrestled with the Lord. And my answer was, I don't know. And uh, I, I, I didn't want to give up my comfort and I didn't want to give up my life. And um, after I wrestled with him for a few hours, I said, yeah, Lord, I will. And he said, I'll tell you what I have for you when you're ready. And when Promise Keepers came along, it was literally pushed into my lap and I tried to push it back with everything in me until I finally went home to my wife and said, well, I think I better take over Promise Keepers or I'm gonna get swallowed by a big fish. <laughs> uh, and here we are. And there happens to be a very clear biblical illustration of that. <laughs> and so you did really yield to the Lord. And I'm just simply gonna tell you, you will get to know him very well in the coming months. Yes, you will. You will know what he means by the rise of servant kings. One of the most profound statements I ever heard come so clearly from the Lord that just hit me so hard is greatest among you a servant. And suddenly he showed me because everybody says you're this effective, gifted, dynamic, powerful speaker. And the Lord showed me that I'd be more effective sitting in a, a chair sitting at his feet, listening to his words and becoming a servant to all the others than I ever would standing in the biggest stadiums in the world. And I have been able to be a servant to people no one ever heard of. We went from winning hundreds of thousands of people to Christ a year to winning three, four, five million people to Christ mm -hmm. every year until we basically lost count because we became a servant and we began to light and put oil in those little lanterns all over the world and the glory of God came down. I believe that God is going to use you to help light the lantern that illuminates and reveals the Lord so clearly. And I believe servant kings, and you're pointing at men becoming what God really designed them to be, and that's not Lord over anything, but Him Lord over us. And I believe with all my heart, you tell me if you bear witness with this, that no woman wants to be, she, they all want to be treated like a queen, but not by a pawn. They want to be treated like a queen by a king who honors That's a them. Great line. Both of them submit to the Lord. Do you agree with Absolutely. that? Absolutely. All right. What do you want us to hear with the rise of servant kings? And when you look at promise keepers and you've already planned for a meeting in AT&T Stadium, we used to call it Cowboy Stadium. We don't boast about cowboy stuff a whole lot right now. Maybe that'll change. <laughs> but the point is the stadium is quite spectacular. Mm. And you believe that God's going to do something as you simulcast the message from the heart of God out to people all over the world and asking men to stand up and become servant kings, what God designed and destined us to be. 
Tell us what's on your heart now when you've moved into this. What do you long to see happen when you refer to servant kings? What are you believing God wants to do? We've got to remind men of who they are in Jesus Christ. And you have such a great story about what happens when you're not affirmed as a man by your father. And that is a growing epidemic in this country. And there are so many men today who have not been affirmed. What does it mean to be a man? And you cannot learn how to be a man unless you learn how to be a disciple. So what does Jesus Christ say that we are? We're servant kings. We're responsible for our sphere. If you're a single man, you're still a king. You're still someone who needs to look out for the poor and the oppressed, for the bullied, to care for women's rights. If you're married, you're responsible for your kids, for your wife, their spiritual walk. It doesn't mean you're at fault because even Jesus lost Judas and uh, he struggled with Peter. So the greatest teacher in the world. So it doesn't mean that you're at fault if your wife or your kids go south, but it does mean you're responsible to do everything you can to present them as spotless and blameless before our Father in heaven. And we need to remind men of that. And we need to get them into AT&T Stadium where 80,000 men could sit together and sing Amazing Grace and look around, take off the mask and put it down and be vulnerable and say, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. And you may be responsible for having caused abortions to happen. You may have thrown $300 at some gal and said, go take care of that problem. You may be addicted to pornography. You may have been an abuser. Jesus loves every one of us if we just lay down our pride, fall on our face, and give our lives to him. He can change all that from the inside out, and that's what I want to let people know. When you listen to him, Betty, and you had the privilege of being with him, his wife, and one of his children for hours and just listening to him, what do you, what do you see when you look at Ken and, and you listen to what you hear coming from him? Well, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly about the man's place as leader in the home, as one that leads his family, his wife. I take great comfort for that. I have a husband that does that and a, and a, and a father that, that led his children. I didn't feel any less important. I felt that I could take my place as the wife and the caretaker of the home in peace and rest because I knew he had my back so to speak. And that brings great comfort me. I think there's a lot of women that desire that. They might not admit it so much because we're so in, you know, you can be independent and still have that covering. And, and, I, and my husband builds me up all the time. He encourages me to be who I am in Christ. And so I think that that is such a hunger today that it's not necessarily recognized, but is needed. So you'd say you're treated like a queen by I a king. Am. I am. Definitely. I love that. You know, one of the stories you tell in, in the book and when you're sharing, you have time, you talk about something happened to one of your partners that really had an incredible impact on your life. Tell us about it. Yeah, I had a partner who was a, a tall Argentina and handsome guy who had a million girls all over him. And he was everything you a man would say he wants to be. Tall, handsome, L.A. cop, uh, girls everywhere. So many girls, actually, that... Back in those days, adultery was, was still a fireball offense on the LAPD. And he had so many flowers being sent to the front desk, the sergeant told him, you've got to tell your girlfriends to stop sending all these flowers or we're going to have to take action. He was that kind of guy. And he kept trying to talk to me one night, and I just didn't have time. We kept having, we were in a real violent area, so violent crime kept coming up. He said, Ken, I need to talk to you about Jesus. And I had talked to Juan about Jesus a million times and never seemed to go anywhere. Finally, uh, I said, Juan, I'll talk to you after we come back from our days off in three days. I'll come to work early and, and we can talk then. And, so uh, you'd mentioned Jesus to him before. He seemed to be indifferent, but now all of a sudden there seems to be a, a curiosity? Or he, did you he think came he wanted to that, argue? What you, he what came you, from that deeply religious Catholic roots of if I just feel bad enough about my sin, then somehow it's okay. Mm -hmm. So he lived in constant guilt and self-loathing, but wouldn't stop his sin. I could never get through to him the grace of Jesus Christ. Does, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So after three days, I came back. I got to work two hours early at Rampart Station and no one. We went to roll call and the captain showed up at 10 o'clock at night and, and captains don't come to roll call. And the captain let me know that Juan had gone down to Mexico and he murdered his girlfriend and killed himself. His girlfriend was a single mother. And I thought, now here is a two-year-old boy orphaned by an LA cop. And I think Juan epitomized the macho guy that we all aspired to be back in the day handsome tall lapd and that was his end and now i think we swung so far the other way 
whereas culture has def has rebelled against that and said, well, now let's have deeply effeminate men. How about if we just end up being the men that Jesus said we are? How about if we just acted like humble, courageous, generous servant kings to all those people around us? I love what you're saying, Ken, and I really do hear the heart of the Lord in it. We want everyone to begin praying for an event that's going to take place this summer that I really believe is not only answer the prayer of everyone who said, God, you're the only one who could heal our land. Mm. And I will tell you that the healing process has begun because the anger, the fury, the hatred, the deception, dissension, division, the destruction, the death, the animosity is absolute revelation of the nature and intentions of the father of lies, whom Jesus said is a murderer. And, and I'd say all the time, you know, the, the devil and the Holy Spirit, if you're saved, are always talking to us. And how do you tell the difference between the voices? Because the, the voice of the Holy Spirit always says, wait, it brings patience and peace, and it always glorifies Jesus. The voice of the devil always brings anxiousness and stress, and it glorifies self, which really glorifies the devil. It's easy to tell the difference. And so when we get to AT&T Stadium, we don't want a bunch of guys sitting around telling themselves, I'm gonna try harder not to look at pornography. I'm going to try harder to be a better dad. We want guys to fall on their face before the Lord and say, I'm giving up my pride because only the grace of Jesus Christ can change my heart. And I'm praying, Ken, it'll be simulcast into areas where people have come together, not just to watch something, but come together to be a part of praying. Thy will be done mm -hmm. on earth as it is in heaven, preceded by thy kingdom come. He wouldn't have told us to pray it if it couldn't happen. He wouldn't have told us to pray it if it's not important. I believe we're going to see it. Father, do it. Do it, Lord, beyond anything we've ever witnessed. Clearly the answer to your prayer, Jesus, in John 17, in our day. Ken, I want everybody who wants to understand your journey and where God's taken you and how it's going to impact men and individuals all over the world, I want them to get the book. You know, we... We love sharing the life of God, not just in word, but in deed. We don't love just in word only, we love in deed. And our viewers have been putting all in little lanterns all over the world. Well, we found a yielded missionary, oftentimes moved their children right in the middle of what looks like hell to bring a glimpse of heaven. And they want to give these people clean water or food. And we told our viewers, we met people gifted of God and submitted to God's will, who moved right into that darkness. But they need us to help. Mm. And boy, have you helped. Right now, with your help, we're going to drill hundreds of water wells. They still cost $4,800 a piece. I want you to look in right now on the situation that you, God in you, are the answer to this challenge. You're the miracle. Watch closely. The water source for this village is visibly unclean. You can clearly see the debris, scum, and wildlife that contaminate it. But it's the unseen parasites in the water that pose the greatest threat, one that took the lives of two of Julianne's children. <laughs> Experience has taught Julianne to walk in fear, knowing she is unable to protect her children from the danger. Unclean water does not have to be the end of the story for Julianne or her children. It doesn't have to be the end of the story for anyone.
How many times have you heard me say, if you want to see your prayers answered, ask God to let you be an answer to someone's prayer. This mother is saying, I need my prayer answered. I've asked God. Betty, our viewers can be the answer to the prayer. And you have been the answer to prayer to so many mothers just like this one, pleading for the life of their children, the heartache of losing one, and then possibly, as you saw, at least three there with her, three more. God, I don't know how she would stand it. It could just kill a mother inside. But I pray that you'll join with us, and let's be the answer to that prayer there. She said, somebody, please get us some clean water for my babies, please. Join with us and do that. And you know, Betty, that's not wishful thinking mm -hmm. because viewers have enabled us to get the necessary drilling rigs to be able to drill the wells in hundreds of locations. Right now, would you consider helping drill a well? They're $4,800. If it's possible that you could actually find the means or maybe you just know, boy, God's really blessed me, I can do that. Would you drill a well? We need many people to step up and say, I can do it and I will. Father, I pray if a person is able to do it, they'll do it joyfully as a cheerful giver with gratitude that you enable them to do it in Jesus' name. You're not only gonna give them a well of water, you're gonna give them a demonstration of the love of God that comes because people have met the water of life, Jesus. And they're gonna present that living Jesus to these people. And millions of people are going to trust Christ just as we've saved their lives by giving them clean water and also by feeding them when they're starving. So please, if you can give a well, do it. If you can give a part of a well, and this happens so often, someone says, oh, I can't do the 4,800, but I can give 12 and ask God to raise up three more and we got a well or 2,400 and just one more match what you do. Please do that if you can. Most of the support comes from people who give 10 people water the rest of their life. You say, how do I do that? That's what $48 will do on the average. $48, 10 people water the rest of their life. Where can you make a better investment? $144, 30 people. There's a level at which everyone can participate. We're gonna send you Sheila's book if you just make a gift. We have some other beautiful, inspirational gifts to bless you with as you bless others with life. And we have a beautiful bronze for those of you who are able to give 1,200 or more. A mother's burden, and I'm telling you, it's a burden they gladly bear. And you're gonna lift a great burden if you just give some water. Would you right now go get your bank card, dial that number and use that like a check? Or would you go online and make the gift right there? That's a wonderful way to be able to give. If you do wanna make a check, make it to life, put it in the mail, but call us and tell us you're mailing it because we've got to notify those with the drilling rigs and all the missionaries, you can count on them. We've got the resources to send those rigs there, to keep everything in place, to give a well. So if you're mailing the check, let us know. If you call, thank you. And by the way, if you're mailing it, call us and tell us you are, because we've got to let everyone know. Thank you so much for giving life. Today, a mother living in extreme poverty will do the unthinkable. Give her children dirty, disease-filled water that she knows could kill them. With no other choice, what's a mother to do? With your help, clean water is on the way. Mission Water for Life is the answer to a mother's prayer to save the lives of her children, to offer them a bright future free from the fear of death. With your gift today, you can help drill and establish 350 water wells this year. Your gift of $24 will help provide clean water for five children. A gift of $48 will help provide for 10, $72 will provide for 15, and $144 will help provide life-giving water for 30 people for a lifetime. With your gift, we'll send you Praying Women, How to Pray When You Don't Know What to Say. In her new book, Sheila Walsh shows you how to reignite your conversation with God to become a strong praying woman. With your gift of $100 or more, please request the Power of Prayer bundle. This bundle includes a cozy throw blanket adorned with words of the Lord's Prayer, a decorative pillow cover, as well as Sheila's book. All three are encouraging reminders of how there's power in your faith-filled prayers. 
Finally, please consider a gift of $1,200 to help provide water for 250 people or a gift of $4,800 to help sponsor a complete well. And you may request our brand new commemorative bronze sculpture, A Mother's Strength. Please call, write, or make your gift online. You know, to be able to give a cup of water in Jesus' name because people like you gave this well where the children are coming to get water. But these children have got clean water because someone like you provided a well and we need to drill them all over the world. We've targeted some areas now. If you will go to the telephone and simply dial the number, it's a lifeline. Make the very best gift you can today, please. If you could give a well, give a well. But whatever you can do, it'll go together with other gifts and enable us to drill another well like this. I pray with all my heart that you not only take seriously giving water, but that you pray for this event in the AT&T Stadium. You help us give water, we're going to send you Ken Harrison's book, I promise you. Boy, will it bless you. Sheila Waltz will send you her book, Praying Women. What a miracle move of God. And Ken, Betty, and I just say to you, you know, we've had to tape with you during the middle of the day. Normally we have a studio full of people that'd be shouting. I tell you what, they'd be standing right now and cheering, praise God for sending you here. Uh, we're we're going to talk about that meeting too in the stadium a little bit more clearly, and I really appreciate you. God bless you. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for giving someone water for life and know they're pointed to the water of life. We love you. Thank you so much. Are you concerned about your family being ill-equipped to manage resources when you pass away? Do you want to leave a legacy gift that impacts the lives of others? As a free service to our friends and partners, Life Planning Services, a ministry of Life Outreach International, is here to help with your estate planning needs and chart your financial future. Do not put off this important step to protect your loved ones and leave a lasting legacy. Contact Life Planning Services today. Promise Keepers at its height in the 90s lost the idea that Jesus is a Promise Keeper, not us. We're the Promise Reapers. Next week, Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.